And uh, that's really kind of a continuation uh, this week of that which we began on last week uh, to just really dig a little deeper, uh, go a little further, get a little bit more understanding yes. uh, from the beginning of time. And last week we, uh, we dealt with uh, just kind of talking in the first part of the lesson kind of reviewing and recapping and talking about dispensations and covenants and all those great things and uh, prayerfully you still got your notes uh, as it relates to those um, and we're talking about how because of the construct of the Bible the way the Bible is constructed that you know sister lips when we uh, need to learn how to how to view the word out of the dispensation that it's written, uh, learning how to view that when in fact we're looking like we are tonight yes. uh, in Genesis, in this first three chapters, that we're viewing this particular teaching and these particular scriptures through the eyes of innocence, which in fact was the dispensation where this word was given. So if I don't understand the dispensation of I don't understand the construct of the text, even though I'm reading, I'm still cheating myself out of some understanding. Mm. So it's good to read. We need to read. Reading the Bible is mandatory, but it is very important that when I'm looking, specifically when I'm looking at Old Testament scripture, while I understand, bro, Bart Knight, that God is a living spirit and he gives revelation now based on what it is we see, it is imperative that we grasp that where we're reading from has an undertone. Hmm. So, so, so if I'm in the New Testament, ain't nothing but grace there. So when I'm reading the New Testament, I can grab that through the eyes that I'm living under right now. Yes. But when I'm in these earlier portions of the Bible, and I'm reading, and I'm seeing, and I'm trying to hear God, it's important for me to be able to grasp the dispensation that the tone of the text is carrying. So if I'm reading, as we're looking at tonight, uh, and as we looked at last week about Adam and Eve, then we know we're looking at this text from the eyes of innocence. Mm -hmm. So when God is dealing with Adam, and God is talking and dealing with Eve and those connected to these first three chapters, we identify that God is dealing with them not on the same level that he deals with us today, because that was under the eyes of innocence. Amen. So as I progress through the Bible and I get out of innocence and I go into consciousness, I go into awareness. Now, when God is preparing to send judgment to the earth, it wasn't that God was being rude or God was being a taskmaster. It was simply he was dealing with them based on the dispensation they were living in. So while it's great for folk to say, oh, I read the Bible in a year. And, you know, I read the, the first eight chapters of the first eight books of the Bible in a week. Okay, uh, that's exciting. But what have you retained? Yeah, and did you yeah. even understand what you were reading? Yeah. Yeah. When, when, when in, in Acts chapter 8, I ain't going there, but in Acts chapter 8, um, you know, we find a story of a man, I preached on this before, with Philip, you know, he's an evangelist, he's a deacon that had been ordained now, he's being transitioned over to being an evangelist in the early church, and uh, the man of God identifies a, a uh, Ethiopian eunuch uh, sitting under a tree, and he's reading the Bible, and uh, Philip goes to him, and he says, man, it's great that you're reading the Bible, but do you even understand what you're reading? Mm -hmm. And the, the eunuch says, man, how can I understand if nobody's taught me? And so uh, Philip, from that point, takes him uh, from the beginning of Jesus' time up to that point, uh, and the man ended up getting saved. The point I'm making is it's good to have knowledge in terms of reading, but we got to always search for understanding. Mm -hmm. All right, all right, all right, all right. So let me, let me, let me, let me do this. Let, let me do this. So, um, all right. So last week, we talked about covenants and dispensations. All right, so this would be like the 20th time in less than a year <laughs> that we talked about this. So uh, less, well, a little more than a year. Let's, let's just help me tonight. All right, so first of all, how many dispensations, covenants, how many are there? Seven. 
Seven. All right, all right. Seven is seven dispensational covenants. All right, we, I, I ain't even going to go no further than that right now. Uh, I'm excited to know that we are aware that there are seven dispensations and covenants in the Bible. All right, where we're dealing tonight, or where we were last week, starting at Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, up through Genesis chapter 3, verse 14, we identified that this was the first covenant in which God was dealing with man. It was the Edenic covenant wherein God is disp the dispensation is governing that covenant. Covenant is the dispensation of innocence. All right? The dispensation of innocence. So tonight, I'm trying to get us to understand that the dispensation that we were under as it relates to the beginning of time, God's role, God's plan were false. God's purpose even today is to simply get us back to this place of innocence. Yeah. All right? So, so, so before Pastor gets any further, maybe in weeks to come, we'll deal with those other five and those other six dispensations. But right now, I want us to really make sure that we can grasp where we were so that we can understand where God is trying to get us back to. All right. If I can't grasp the characteristics of the Edenic Covenant, then even though I'm saved and I'm going to heaven, I'm going to miss out on a lot of the heaven I'm supposed to experience on earth. Mm. Okay. I said this before. I'm going to say it again. Heaven is our end game. That At the end of the day, when you close your eyes, Mr. Gaines on, on different work back in the day said, well, you take a dirt nap. The reality is it is at that point that you will be in the heavens. You won. Thank you, Jesus. But what I'm trying to get us to understand is these 80 years, these 70 that's promised, uh, 80 if by reason of strength, that we get on earth is actually supposed to be filled with heaven. That's good. I'm not supposed to experience heaven only when I get there. Mm -hmm. I'm supposed to have a glimpse of it here on earth so that one, I'll know how to act when I get there. <laughs> oh, that's good. Okay. All right. All right. Um, so, in innocence, in innocence, we talked last week. Uh, let, let me just, just throw some stuff at me, please, if you can. If you got some notes, this is great. I, I ain't listening for dispensation and covenants right now. I'm listening for recap as it relates to what we talked about last week. There were some things that I said was connected to the Edenic covenant, some things that were connected to innocence. Uh, and what were some of those things, please, if we remember? Okay, uh, the, the Edenic and the Edenic covenant, we've been anointed with dominion. That's good. That's good. That's absolutely right. We've been given, we've been given dominion. How so was that? How so was dominion shown in the Edenic covenant? What happened to prove that we had dominion? Well, God gave Adam dominion over the animals and had him name the animals. That's it. Excellent. God gave Adam dominion and said, listen, uh, I want us to catch this. Everything God created, he did it in six days, right? Yes. The first five days, he dedicated to all the other stuff. But the sixth day was the day he created man. So God really saved man yes. for the last. Mm -hmm. So the last thing, I want you to catch this, D, the last thing that God created was the thing that was designed to have dominion over everything he created before. That's good. Mm -hmm. So the last thing that God created when he made man and he said it was good, it was in that creation of man that he says, now I'm going to give you dominion over everything else that I created. Mm -hmm. So an act of that dominion was, God says, Adam, since I've given you dominion, I want you now to name everything that you want. Just whatever you want it to be, that's what it's going to be called. Right. So we identify, Sister Foster, that God gave us dominion and power in our mouth. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Please catch this tonight. Uh, power, the dominion that you have, is not with your fist, is not with your feet, is not with your attitude. Your dominion is in your mouth. Hmm. Wow. Okay, I don't think we caught it yet. Mm -hmm. All right. So if dominion, Sister Thompson, is in my mouth, yes, sir. that means whatever I say, say. Uh -huh. is what it is. Uh -huh. That's good. Whatever you speak. That's right. So if I'm still speaking that you ain't going to be nothing, that's what it is. That's good, sir. If I'm still speaking death over my body, 
That's what it is. That's the man. So whatever I want to see is what I have to say. So when Adam had this four-footed thing coming at him that growled a little bit, he said, you're a bear. And when he named it a bear is when it became a bear. All right. So, so, so when I got my wife in front of me, hmm. if I'm naming her a queen, yes, Lord. that's what she's got to be. That's good. Yeah, you're teaching. I don't know if I am. Or you not. are. Yeah. Because the reality Even if it's is a spirit when we pastor. get a clue <laughs> yeah, yeah. that it's in our mouths, yes, help sir. me tonight, Jesus. Yes, you're helping us. That when we say it, it is. Mm. So whatever program you want to see, yeah. you got to say. Yes. Mm. Because God says whatever you say it is, mm. is what it is. Yes, sir. Okay. So if I want a six-figure job, yeah. I got to speak a six-figure job. Yeah. Because whatever I say, it is. <laughs> we finally get it. God said this is, Sister Lipscomb, the place I'm trying to get you back to. Mm. We, okay, good, good, good. He's trying to get us back to this place of innocence. Now, uh, okay, so do, Dominion, I, I, I can't, I, Lord help me, I got a long way to go. All right, uh, Dominion, we got, what, what was something else that we said uh, was connected to this uh, dispensation of innocence, the Edenic covenant? What was something else? Eden is not a geographical place. Oh God. It's a state of mind. Yes, two, two good things. Eden is not a geographical place. Eden is a state of mind, which means that wherever my mind takes me is where Eden is. Mm. They have done excavations. They have searched in, uh, you know, by the Euphrates River. They've done all these things, and nobody can physically identify this place called Eden because Eden was simply an expression of God's presence. Mm. Eden was an expression of God's presence. So whenever I want to find Eden in my own life, I've got to learn how to get into his presence. In his presence is Eden. Uh, Evangelist Graham said it, and she read on it. In the Edenic covenant, we also got provision, which means whatever it is that we need, it was already there. That's awesome. God said, I created this. Now, Adam, all you've got to do is go get it. Yay. It's there for you. Go get it. Provision. Everything that I need is already there. Mm -hmm. But I got to be connected to the one that created. Somebody else, please. Something, something else. God's presence causes things to grow. His presence. God help me. Thank you so much, Sister Boston. You take great notes. His presence calls or helps things to grow. It was, I said, well, before I say it, let me see if y'all can tell me. Why, why did I make that point last week? There had never been rain. There you go. Sister, that's why I got excited. All of us turned this the podium over. There had never been rain in the earth before. Nobody knew what rain was, Brakanya. They didn't know what rain looked like, sound like, felt like, or smelt like. All they knew, all Adam knew, is that God caused stuff to grow because he let a mist yes, from his it. presence yes, sir. Mm -hmm. make things around it grow. That's amazing. Just the mist. Let me, let me okay, I, I got a long way to go, but I got to get there. Okay, uh. Um, I, I, has anybody ever, um, I ain't talking about light rain now, I'm talking about literally, has anybody ever walked through a mist before? Uh -huh. yeah. Yeah. All right, all right. So, so, so when, <laughs> when I walk through, I ain't trying to trip you up. Just, just, just think it's not deep. I ain't trying to get a new revelation. I'm just asking a question. So, so let's bring our thinking up from the depths. We ain't got to go that deep. Uh, somebody tell me something about walking through mist. Just just give me something uh, about it. It's light and soft. It's light and it's soft. Your whole right. body is touched. Your whole body is touched. Refreshing. Refreshing. You get wet. Say, say it again. You get wet. Say it one more time. You get wet. Okay. You, you, you get wet walking through mist. But, but, but let somebody to help me. Uh, uh. A mist and a rain. Uh -huh. Which one I'm going to get 
the most drenched in. Right. 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 Okay. So 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 mist has the ability uh, to to cause there to be moisture or whatever. But is mist enough for something to really grow out of? No. no. Mm, how about that? That's right. That's good. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Natural mist, imagine this ground. You can plant a million seeds of tomato or whatever. And that mist that's coming will have to drop for about a million years for this tomato to actually grow. Yeah. However, the mist of God's presence wasn't rain. It was the mist of his presence that caused stuff to grow. Pastor, what you trying to tell me? What I'm trying to tell you is this. God took something that was foolish and confounded his own creation. Hmm. Oh, God, help me. Okay, uh, a, a mist ain't going to help nothing, especially not no whole acreage of trees and stuff to grow. However, the mist of his presence caused trees, vegetation, everything to grow. Pastor, what are you telling me? I'm trying to get us to understand the enormity of God. Yeah. Okay, what does that mean, Pastor? That means you don't even really need God to give you his full attention. Mm. Supernatural. This is good. Yes, sir. All you need is a mist <laughs> of his presence. Yes, sir. A portion mm. of his presence. And folks, you know, for years, so listen, they've been praying, oh, Lord, I need to see your hand move. No, you don't. All you need is the clipping of his fingernail to move. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be more than what you can handle. All you need is him to just think about it one time. Mm, help me here. Okay, so, so the, <laughs> mist, the mist of his presence called everything to go. Great. So, somebody else. I, got, I, I know it was something else that we got in there. Nobody. He's been talking about, I'm, I got to understand what peace and purity is when it shows up. You can accept it and know what it looks like. Y'all think you're taking me to a Sunday. Oh, Amen. Okay. We give God praise. Yeah. <laughs> you, took, you took me back to Concord High School. Amen. Are uh, you good? You got, one of the things I started to um, the purpose of Christ is not just for us to be forgiven of sin, but reconnected with oh, God. Yeah, yeah, okay. Oh, no, I, I didn't got, I gave y'all something last week that I need to give you this week. So we're we going to come back to that. But that's, that's right on it. That, that, is, that his purpose was designed not just for me to be, you know, forgiven, but it was about a restoring. I, I, I'm, I'm going to come there a little later. I, I'm going to come a little later. Give, give me something else, though, about if we got anything else. If not, I got something written down. And anything like God gives us a job, and then I wrote, Thank you. should be evident in marriage. Thank you. Yeah, even though you ain't even realized why you wrote it and the question mark in your voice, it's still right on point. And the Edenic Covenant in innocence. Uh, uh, my, my great sister uh, uh, Thompson uh, back here. We, we identify that in the Edenic Covenant there was given the gift of marriage. And not only was the gift of marriage given, that was the question mark, it says black people, black boy, but there was also given to us a job. God says, I'm trying to get you back to this Edenic state of mind, to this place of innocence. There was employment. God told Adam, hmm. even though I created all of this, yes, your responsibility is to keep it and to dress it. To keep it and to dress it. He says, I need you to prove, Brother Foster, that you can work <laughs> this job before I let you name your wife. This, this should be probably for oh, men in uh, good marriage. Right here. Uh, I need you to prove to me that you can keep this garden and dress this garden so I can trust you to keep your wife and dress your wife. Right. Uh, God help me tonight. Uh, uh, Pastor, what does that mean? Well, thank you so much for asking me. It gets me excited when you ask. All right. But the reality is, God says, before Wakanya, I can put you in connection to be in authority over another. It has to be proven to me, this, this is heavy, this is good. Uh, that you're not lazy. Yeah. Mm. Oh, God, help me today. Uh, because if you can't, Adam, keep up this garden that I've already kept up. Wow. We, we, we yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. His job was a cake job. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Let me take y'all back. I, I preached this in my in my first sermon at the path of Belton Fisher. I use this analogy. And I never got this good uh, When I was growing up, sister, sister, uh, sister Bart Mack, uh, who is her birthday, by the way, happy birthday, Sister Bart Mack. Uh, so when, when I was growing up, when I was growing up, you know, uh, my, my grandfather, who was going to be with the Lord this time, my grandfather believed, Minister Black, yes, uh, that, that every young man, uh, specifically that was going to be connected to the Majet lineage, uh, was going to know how to cut grass. Yes, sir. Uh, that, that was just, that was a rite of passage. It was just the way it was. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm the youngest, I'm really the youngest of all the cousins. Uh, so that definitely makes me also the youngest of the male cousins. So the two oldest cousins are, are guys. Then it was all all girls. Then I, I came along at, at, at the end. So it's about 11 years difference between my oldest cousin and myself. So uh, my, my, my two oldest cousins, you know, they like a year apart, a little more. So my grandfather would take them. Now, I, I'm a baby, you know, so I don't know nothing about what's going on. He would take them out to uh, this place. He owned some land from his, his mom, uh, and they would have to cut grass out there. That was just the rite of passage. You had to go through these things. And so everybody got older, right? So in the getting older, uh, the rite of passage then fell on past him. So uh, when I was 10 years old, Minister Black, I'll never forget this as long as Jesus gives me breath in my body. When I was 10 <laughs> years old, uh, birthday's in January, so uh, by the time the summer came around, uh, as, a, as a 10 year old, uh, my grandfather would say, All right, uh, it's time for you to get out here and learn how to cut this grass. Now, what my grandfather would do, bro, Bart Knight, in the early in the early stages, before he would take me to his his mom's property, he would have me come cut his grass. The interesting thing about my grandfather is he would cut his grass on Friday, <laughs> and then have me come cut it on Saturday. <laughs> now, 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 check out, check something out here. He says, "I'm gonna do the work for you. Right. Mm -hmm. right. I just want to know." If you're not going to be lazy and come back and do what I've already done. Wow. You ain't got to work. You ain't, you're going to sweat because you're outside. But the lines yes, are sir. already there. Follow. Come on. All you got to do is trace the lines. This is good. Wow. And after you trace the lines, I'm going to pay you. Mm -hmm. And you know what, Brooke Kanye? That's At awesome. first, I got really excited because I'm like, man, I'm doing a great job <laughs> cutting this grass. <laughs> I ain't even have an idea that he was actually cutting the grass a day before me. No clue. I'm going out there, and I'm like, well, it looked kind of low out here, but okay, I guess this is how grass supposed to look. So I, I'm, he says, follow the line, follow the line. So I, I follow the line. And it was about a year later that when I realized what he was doing, later, yeah. he stopped doing. Catch this. Mm. So the wow. first year, as wow. he was teaching me, wow. he would go out the day before, wow. cut the grass, to make sure I understood how the grass should look right. after it's finished. Right. Right. Well, when the next summer came around, you know, I'm kind of excited, bro, Connie, because I know all I got to do is go out here and trace, <laughs> and I'm going to get paid. But I looked, and something looked different about the grass <laughs> this year. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Wait a minute, granddaddy. The grass is up to here now. What's this about? He said, go out there and cut the grass. I said, well, granddaddy, it's never been this high before. He said, but you know how to do it. So I went outside real fast. And I'm like, well, hmm, let me just start my own line. And when I start one, maybe I can trace back on what I'm doing. And I found myself learning how to cut grass, following what mentally my grandfather had already done. Yes, sir. God said to Adam, I'm not calling you to recreate anything. All I want you to do is go out there and trace the lines. Mm. Wow. Mm. Yeah. I already count. And after you prove to me, Adam, that you can trace the lines, then I'm going to let you get companionship in your life. This is something you ought to always know, and I want everyone, these little young, these young ladies in here and the young men in here to hear this clearly. All right, let me talk to the ladies first. If he does not have a job, hmm. he is not your husband. Amen. That's clear. Say that. <laughs> if he does not have a job, yes, sir. I ain't talking about he's still uh, cutting grass with granddad and getting paid $10 a week. That's not a job. If he doesn't have a W-2, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> he is not your husband. That's called clarity. Mm -hmm. At least. At least a W-2. I want you to have a W-2 and a couple of 10 dollars What does that mean, Pastor? You got your side hustle, too. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. If he don't have a job with his cute self, mm. with his six-pack having self, mm. with his mama car driving self, mm. he is not your boo. Mm. Clarity. And to these young whippersnappers, mm. Tony, Chris, in days to come, Harrison, 
the young too cool for school back here. The reality is, if you don't have a job, yes. you are not eligible to be nobody's husband. That's a good word, sir. Right. Eligible. Good word. That's right. Where do you work? Because if I don't have a job, I haven't even proved to God mm. that I'm capable of keeping a wife. That's My God. God. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just start sweating to hear that. I know it. The reality is, God says he wants us to be able to realize that in this Edenic state of mind that we've got a job. And then he gives us a wife. All right. I'll I, 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 I wait till, till in days to come to review that. I, I got to get into where I want to go tonight. Lord, y'all didn't got me all. I've been 30 minutes out there. Okay. Um, so tonight, what I'm trying to get us to understand is that God wants to bring us back to this Edenic place, this place where provision, uh, dominion, authority, blessing, employment, you know, uh, uh, marriage, all these things are. So let's, let's get some understanding of the word innocent, all right? The word innocent. The word innocent means, this is just a straight English definition, the word innocent means to be free from sin. That's why, I, that's why I had to get into where I got to go tonight, because I, I, I'm going to teach you something that if you never knew it before, thank you, sir, you're going to know it tonight. Innocence or innocent means to be free from sin. Innocent also means to be not guilty of a specific crime. Not guilty of a specific crime. Innocent also means to be harmless and without guile. Harmless. And without guile. Okay. So, God is saying, well, let, let me make sure we, we catch this. Pastor Hinton said God is trying to do what to us? He's trying to get us back where? To a place of innocence. To a place of innocence. All right? He's trying to get us back to a place that we're free from sin, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we're harmless, mm -hmm. that we're without guile, that we're not <coughs> guilty of a specific crime. This, Sister Bolt Knight, is where God is trying to get us back to. To a place where we are free from sin. Okay, let's, let's go to 1 John. God help me tonight to teach this thing and let your people grab it. That they'll walk out of here knowing what they need to do. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. 1 John chapter 3. Oh God, this is going to get so good. And I, I, I'm going to make sure I'm teaching you. And I ain't going to be preaching. First John. First John chapter 3. First John chapter 3. Lord, help me tonight. First John chapter 3. I, I'm going to look at the first 10 verses. Oh, God, help me tonight. Okay. Uh, first John chapter 3, verse 1 says, Behold, what man of love the Father have bestowed upon, that, upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Yes. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, mm -hmm. we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself, even as he is pure. Whosoever committeth sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. And ye know that he was manifested to take away our sins. And in him is no sin. Whosoever abideth in him sinneth not. Mm. Let me see that again. Whosoever abideth in Jesus sinneth not. Whosoever sinneth hath not seen him, neither.